Hello and welcome everyone. It is September 19th, 2023, and we are in ActInf Math Stream number 7.1 at the Active Inference Institute. We're here with Vincent Wang Mashinitsa and guests. It should be quite a discussion, certainly a unique one by what we can already see. So thank you all for joining. We'll be looking forward to this presentation and interleaving discussion. Thanks, Dan. Um, so hi, my name is Vincent, and uh, with me today also is Hamza in the audience. Uh, we're both authors on this paper that uh, we'll be talking today, Constructor Theory as Process Theory. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what should the format of this discussion be? So I'd like to tell you a bit about Constructor Theory and process theory, and then we can sort of have a discussion about uh, the, the sort of diagrammatics of process theory, how that might fit with active inference. Um, and all this, you know, you can view it as an exercise and sort of seeing things in a, in a diagrammatic way. Um, so I'll get started and the structure will be roughly, I'll talk about what constructor theory is first, just from a conceptual level, because I'm the only non-physicist among the authors of this paper. Um, Hamza is a physicist, so any questions about specific examples is uh, there to be directed to Hamza. Uh, and then, you know, after that, I'm going to do just a sort of lightning fast introduction to what a process theory is. And then we'll put the two together and then we'll have a discussion. And throughout, I will be making pauses to sort of invite questions and make sure everyone is on the same page conceptually. But everything should be super, super easy because uh, I think all of the ideas really are, you know, fundamentally, they're, they're quite simple. Okay, so without further ado, what is constructor theory? Constructor, that's a... So you may have heard of this already because there's quite a lot of hype. They have a, they have a very good PR machine, if nothing else. So among other things, it's been described as, and I think this is from a Quanta article, a master theory, a set of ideas so fundamental that all other theories would spring from it. And in fact, if you go to Deutsch's original paper on constructive theory, he goes so far to say that all other theories of physics, you know, we'll call them, you know, it doesn't matter if it's thermodynamics or quantum or relativity, gravity, whatever. We'll just call them subsidiary theories because that's how big and important constructive theory is. And, uh, you know, there's this eponymous book by Chiara Maletto, The Science of Can and Can't. I want to say that, oh, well, you know, Constructive theory is about counterfactuals and what, what is and isn't possible in the domain of physics. Um, and all this is all this sounds really impressive, but you know the question is what do you, what do you mean by what do you mean by this? So how this how this all started is uh, uh, some of Chiara's students, Aniset and uh, Ria Valiaris, they they came over to the Wolfson Quantum Foundations discussion. And they were nice enough to sit down and tell us about what constructive theory really is. Because, you know, historically, it's been really difficult to sort of pin down, you know, to pin down, like, you know, what is the math want? Uh, what do you really mean here by all these words? And, uh, well, they, you know, they're, they're happy to say, look, you know, it's a meta theory. You can sort of bring your own mathematics. You know, what we really, there, there's a sort of, methodological approach of uh, constructive theory that's more important than the specific mathematics that you want to use to instantiate all these words, like uh, what is a constructor and what is possible and what is impossible. But OK, I'll, I'll tell you conceptually what constructor theory is. So first, I want, you, I want you to let's talk about a space of conceivable processes. Conceivable is the word here. The, the use of the word conceivable will become clear soon because um, we're going we're gonna to cut this space shortly. And what, what are the sorts of conceivable processes that we might have? Well, let's, let's look at a limited subset. Let's talk about ice cream. There's sort of, there's a sort of simple process that can always happen, which is you might have some ice cream, you leave it out for too long, and then the ice cream melts, comes a puddle. This is, you know, we want to say this is obviously a conceivable process. There's another conceivable process where the opposite thing happens. You have the ice cream that's melted, and then 
it spontaneously unmelts and becomes an ice cream again. This is a conceivable process as well. And then there's the straight up, you know, ridiculous stuff that, you know, we, we know for sure is not going to happen in the domain of physics. Like, for example, you have an ice cream and then you've got some machine such that you can take it and you can take, you put in anything and it performs, it performs this process or task of, of taking your input and copying it, everything perfectly down to the, down to the quantum states. You know, you're, you're, you're cloning the ice cream. And you may be aware there's this quantum no cloning. So we, we know that this, this sort of thing is, you know, not going to happen. Nevertheless, all of these are conceivable processes um, of relationships between possible inputs and possible outputs. I should stop using the word possible, just inputs and outputs. Right. <clears throat> so what is the aim of constructor theory really? Well, it stems from this desire to classify the space of conceivable processes into that which is possible and that which is impossible. Well, what might we say intuitively? We might say that well, we we're pretty sure that we're pretty sure that this this ice cream melting stuff that's possible in terms of some theory of physics that that explains everything. And I go, okay, fine. Like some theory of physics that explains what happens to ice cream. We definitely want to say that ice cream melting is possible. Um, and we definitely, you know, that theory of physics also has got to say that this uh, sort of cloning situation here, that's got to be, that's got to be no good. That's, that's impossible. And then the difficulty comes when you've got the cases in the middle where, okay, well, technically, if we're just using English, I mean, it, it is conceivable, it is possible that an ice cream can spontaneously uh, reform itself. It, I mean, it can happen. The laws of physics don't forbid it. It is simply very, very unlikely. Um, what is Deutsch's idea that we should say, no, 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 you know, let's do away with the complexities of statistics and just say that that's straight up impossible, right? So then the goal of constructor theory is to take the space of conceivable processes and cut it, just one cut, corresponding to, on one side, what is impossible, and on the other, what is possible, right? So just using this one sort of concept or duality, what is possible and impossible, it is like you take your space of conceivable processes and you just determine what's possible and impossible. And here's the subtle part. Then you claim that any theory of physics corresponds precisely to the content of one of these cuts. And what do I mean by that? Well. I mean is that, well, you know, here's this is one space of conceivable processes that happens to talk about, for example, the dynamics of ice cream. But there are all kinds of conceivable spaces of processes that might govern, you know, different sort of domain or domains or, or magisteria or whatever you want to call them of, uh, of phenomena. And the idea is that, well, you know, anytime you have a theory of physics, what do you really have? You really have just a domain of phenomena that you care about. And constructive theory says, and in addition to that, a cut that tells you whether, you know, what things are possible in that domain and what things are not possible. And so then every pair of, you know, sort of domain plus one of these cuts that tells you what is possible and impossible is going to kind of encode or summarize, just be a particular theory of physics, right? And so we can be very empathetic to this, this uh, we can be very empathetic to this kind of formulation. It's a, it's a nice thing to try to do to sort of, uh, to summarize or have a sort of bird's eye view of all these different uh, theories of physics to try to boil it down to something that's conceptually a bit simple. Um, but of course, there are problems too, right? So one problem is, well, you know, why didn't you call it possibility theory rather than constructor theory? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But possibility theory sounds a bit too much like a mathematical theory, and it doesn't sound as sexy as constructor theory. So that's one reason you might want to call it constructor theory. Uh, but then what is a constructor? What do constructors have to do with all of this, this idea of possibility and impossibility? Well, you see... The difficulty was if you go back and you think about the case of the ice cream melting, that's something that is possible by our usage of the word. 
but you'd want to be able to stick it on one side of the cut and call that impossible, right? The solution, unfortunately, is verbicide. What you do is you simply make up a technical concept. You call this concept the possible. You call this concept possibility of a of a task, let's say, and then you well, what do you mean by possibility of task? Well, that relies on you know defining what these constructors are. Uh, possibility defines depends on defining what constructors are, and constructors in turn depend on. On, on the definition of tasks, and then tasks finally are, are something that you can cash out in terms of processes. So this is this is the idea of where constructor theory wants to go. And now I'm going to tell you how it is that constructor theorists get there, right? Uh, let's see. Do we have um, do we have any questions at this point? Any sort of conceptual questions or clarifications that anyone wants to? Because otherwise. I'm going to move on. Where does likely or unlikely fit? That's all on one side of the line. What if something's vanishingly unlikely, but possible? That is an absolutely brilliant question. Um, and the answer is you get to choose as long as you make a cut because so the dogma of constructive theory goes, you only get possible and impossible. I don't care how you pick how to distinguish the likely and vanishing unlikely. And I didn't make up the rules. I'm merely telling you that everything has to be either possible or impossible. Good question. Sorry, that's the best. <laughs> that's the best I can do. Um, okay. Three. So. Right. What is constructor theory? All right, it's a first. It's a meta theory. Bring your own map. The meta theory. What does that? What does that mean? That means bring your own map. Okay. Let's start from what is a constructor. Well, you know what? This might be this might be better if I you know I'm looking at I'm looking at these notes now and I'm going like nope I'm gonna it it wouldn't make sense if I started from there I'm gonna have to put that as the as the bottom thing and then we'll we'll get there. What is a uh, constructor, right? Okay. Let me start with defining what a task is. So all of this so far is going to be in English, and then we're going to translate to math in a second. But hold on. Let's let's talk about what a task is first. From a task, you get on to this. Remember, we, we said that something was conceivable. We have to break down that initial diagram that we drew, this initial informal thing. We, we had the sort of the space of all conceivable tasks. So first, we have to define what do we mean by tasks? What do we mean by conceivable tasks? And then from conceivable, let's just talk about what do we mean by a possible task, right? And then it will turn out that a constructor is a the constructor is a, is something that's associated with a possible task. So the, you see that there's a difficulty here of getting from constructors to the, the you know where ultimately you want to go. There's there's a sort of yeah, right. Logic of justification, logic of discovery, and they got they got to go differently. Okay, fine. So, what is a task? Well, remember we're allowed to we're allowed to bring our own mathematics here. So, we 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 asked them. We 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 took a lot of care to ask them. You know, what what sort of math do you want? You know, what do you need here and there? And then finally, you know, it came down to look, look. Really, what we care about as constructor theorists is just defining these things. Once you pick some sort of sensible interpretation of these things in mathematics, then you can go ahead and play the game of constructor theory. So we go, okay, that's fantastic. You know, so so here we have a here in Oxford we have a uh, we have a, a nice sort of homebrew math. What we you know we call them process theories, but otherwise they're known as symmetric nodal categories. So we say, okay, well let's let's call let's call a task a, a process. A process in a symmetric monoidal category. 
Okay, well, we'll get to what that means in a second. So what is a conceivable task that becomes, well, that becomes mathematically trivial, it just becomes a process inside a process theory. What is a possible task? Well, possible task is going to be, and then here's where we have to get technical again. What is a possible task? Well, it's defined as, some, as an infinitely iterable task. Infinitely iterable, yada, yada. OK. And then if a task turns out to be one of these infinitely, if, if, a, if a task turns out to be infinitely iterable, we call it possible. And a task always is doing something, and then there's something in the environment that's helping it do it. That's something in the environment. This super ancillary thing at the end of this, these definitions is going to be what a constructor is. And at this point, it will be very helpful to actually go through an example. And it so happens that by going through this example, just in the diagrammatic form, you will understand process theories. Because the whole point of process theories and symmetric monodal categories is that you have this formal diagrammatic syntax that's extremely intuitive. You don't have to know anything about the category theory. You can just use the diagrams. And there's a formal syntax where you sort of can't go wrong as long as you're just like composing the boxes and the wires. So I'm going to now give an example of. I'm going to make an example of a constructor. And this is also a good time. So now that I'm erasing, anytime I'm erasing, it's a good time to chime in with questions. Sure, one question from the chat. Upcycle mm -hmm. Club wrote, does this mean that constructor theory as a process theory indeed takes into account the no deleting theorem? <clears throat> um, no, no deleting? What do, you, what do you mean? I, I'm not familiar with not this. Not sure no if that's what was theory. written. Or maybe you referenced no cloning earlier. I referenced no cloning. Ah, so here's the, yeah, so here's the nice bit. So earlier I drew a diagram where there are all these different blobs of different colors, and each one was a different uh, domain of physics or whatever, right? So it turns out that, you know, part of the content of a process theory or, or of a symmetric model category is that you have to pick a category, an ambient category in which you're interpreting. And that choice of ambient category uh, tells you about the sorts that that is a choice of the conceivable processes. So if you choose the category of quantum processes and quantum maps, it will turn out that in that setting, you have no cloning. But if you pick a different setting, like for example, maybe you want just sets and functions, you know, mathematical sets and functions, in which case, of course, you can copy. You can always, you know, copy down any information that you have, you know, as long as it's all on paper and you're just using sets and functions, right? But in physics, fine, you, you want to model it with the process theory of, uh, of quantum maps, then you don't get you know, it. So it depends on, it depends on the choice of, uh, choice of interpreting category. But that's, that's a very good conceptual question. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> so talk about a task. I'm going to make a task here. I draw these tasks as directed boxes with wires. Um, so this is this is just what am I drawing here? Okay, I've drawn these directed so because I want everything to be read from left to right. Okay. Now in a process theory, every process is drawn as a box. A process is something that takes as input over here some systems and does something to it, whatever, and then it outputs some systems. And then processes can be composed in you know the kind of usual way that one expects this is a composite process for example All right so what is the process so what is the process here well okay let's let's talk about uh these systems what do i mean by these systems they can be just about anything They're subject to a couple of rules the rules are anytime you have a system you just need some way to talk about what it means to have two of these systems side by side. So let's say that the green system is uh, see the green system here. So now this is something that takes in a green system and a orange system and gives back the green system and the orange system. So it's something that's acting on these systems, it returns them. And what do I mean by a system? Well, a system can be, it will, 
mathematically, we would call them a type, like a system can be like the Booleans, or they, they can be a set, or they can even have the vector spaces as systems. And if you have vector spaces as systems, there are lots of different ways that you can interpret this idea of sticking two systems side by side. Uh, you can have the direct sum of vector spaces, you can have the tensor product of vector spaces, and all of them would give you valid process theories. So you have linear maps with direct sum or linear maps with tensor products, and that would all give you a process theory or a symmetric nodal category in which you can interpret the diagrams you're drawing here. So let's let's come up with a simple one though. A simple one is let's say that this green system is going to be oh this is terribly drawn out. That's a slightly better. So it's shoes, all right? It's a shoe. So let's say it's a particular shoe, right? That that helps. And what is this other system? So what is this other system? I'm going to call this other system the system of a bucket with a paintbrush. Bucket, and here's a paintbrush. All right. This is perfectly fine systems to talk about. These systems can be in different states. Like for example, a shoe can be, well, it can be clean or it can be dirty or have all these different colors. With the bucket, well, let's let's talk about buckets, you know, sort of having paint inside. Maybe the bucket has some paint in it, maybe it doesn't. That's a good example of the system. And I want to model a particular task here, which is paint the shoe. Right. It's a process. Well, why do, I, why do I call it a task? Well, to turn up to to view a process as a task, I have to I have to look at it in the right way. I have to say like, okay, well, there's got to be one there's got to be one sort of system that's input and output. I want to call that system the substrate. Well, why? Because a task has to, you know, that, that's the substrate there. You, you know, painting has to happen to something. If you're one of you painting as a task and the substrate of the painting is going to be the shoe. And what about this other, what about the, what about the paint? Well, the paint part, okay, well, that's going to be part of what we call just here. Everything else, that's going to be the environment. Okay. It's going to be a substrate, an environment, but then what do we what do we mean by successfully painting a shoe? Well, okay. So here I'm gonna to need to introduce I need to induce a concept. So a green wire is the shoe system. And this orange wire is the bucket and paint system. Let's remember that. So now Here's the new kind of process. Uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, I could draw this like this. This is fine. Here's a new kind of process. So I'm drawing processes, and you've seen the process at this point that takes inputs and has outputs. What about a process that doesn't take any inputs and just gives you an output? Well, those we call states. They're a special kind of process. In the process theory of sets and functions, or the symmetric modal category, I should say, of sets and functions with Cartesian products, states are elements of sets. In the process theory of relations, states are subsets of sets, and systems are sets. In uh, in I think any vect, whether whether it's the direct sum or the tensor product, the state is a vector. Um, <clears throat> so states really are just sort of like some. You're really we really call it you know it's a sort of a play on words because I was saying like oh well you know the system can have states their systems can be in different states. The idea is that, well, actually, the name is well chosen so that a state really is picking out, you know, one of the states of the system that you're interested in. Let's say that we'll call there's there's a sort of state of the shoe, which is that it's unpainted. And there's a state of the bucket and bucket and paint system, such that you got a bucket that's full of blue paint. And what do I mean by the task of painting the shoe. Let's see, how much is visible? Oh, I've got all of that, all of the side over here, right. Now you will see your first process theoretic equation. So here's a shoe that's now blue. And here's a bucket of paint. That's now, it's got no more blue paint in it. So what we got here. Let's say here. 
So here's full. And here, let's say it's let's say it's white. Starts off the white shoe. And at the end, we got the painted. We have here empty. And oops. this is a process theoretic equation. I hope you can see all the data that's happening here. Well, what we're saying is that okay, look. If I've got as initial states, I've got like a, I've got an unpainted shoe, and I've got a full bucket of paint. What this process does is it takes the two systems. It views one of them as a, it just keeps track. It says, okay, well, this one's a substrate, and this one's the environment. And what is the result of applying that process to my two states? Well, then I have to end up with two new states. And those states are saying, well, okay, now I, I end up with a painted shoe and I use up all my paint. So now I have an, I have an empty can of paint as another state. Is that clear? Because that's, that's, if you understand this, then you'll understand everything else I'm about to say. This is maybe the only, this is the only conceptually difficult part <laughs> of constructive theory as process theory. We, are we happy with this? If anyone's unhappy or has any conceptual questions, and now's the right, now's the right time to ask. It seems like we kind of put a box around the entire crux of the issue, but at this level of ah, abstraction, yeah. indeed. Right. In indeed. Right. I mean, like, yeah, of course. You, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of boxing away the crux of the issue, but we, we, in fact, we haven't even gotten to rather we haven't even gotten to the the crux of what a constructor is yet. I'm merely defining what it is that, for something to be a task. I mean, you can then pick so so. The point also of a process theory is that you can work at the level of abstraction you so choose. Think of this, you know, if you if you code, this is basically you're declaring what the types of the the method or the function are. It's still on you to go fill in the implementation details. But here we're just dealing with the level of this. This is the level of abstraction where it's it's uh, perfectly okay to start working to just define what we mean by a constructor. And remember that this is still just an example. At some point, you can just erase all the labels and just keep the coloring that indicates the types, and then that would this would be the abstract specification of what a task and a constructor is. Yeah. So you're you're right. We are hiding away a lot of the we are hiding away you know the crux of the the difficulty or the meat, but uh, we're doing so in service of sort of getting at a, a formal incarnation of what constructor theory is. So yeah. Um. Okay. <clears throat> so. Kind of happy with this. Now I'm going to redo some of this. Let's see. I want here. So now, well, let's suppose that it's a, you know maybe it's a small bucket of paint. And it's a fairly big shoe. In either case, the content of the equation was that you know you you stick in this full bucket of paint, and then at the end of it, you you run out of paint. You finish painting the shoe, but you run out of paint. And what that means as a sort of diagrammatic consequence, what happens if we want to paint a shoe twice? What do I mean by that? OK, well, here, here's two shoes. And just to distinguish them, I mean, uh, just to distinguish them, let's say that this one starts off like a nice yellow shoe, and this one's a nice orange shoe. And then in the end, we still have this, we have this again, this bucket of paint. That is kind of that is full. What do I mean by painting painting two shoes? Well, okay, let's 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 paint them in the order that they're closest. So first, we want to apply the the paint shoe task. Right, we end up with some shoe system. We end up with some bucket of paint system. And we want to say, okay, well, send that that first system. We send it away. That second system, we bring it in. All right now, let's line things up again. And let's apply this again. All right. Here's the paint shoe. And here's, you know, let's try it again. Let's try to paint the shoe. All right. <clears throat> and now we've, we're, we're seeing a new uh, diagrammatic component, which corresponds to the word symmetric in a symmetric monodal category. The idea is that, well, 
in a symmetric monoidal category, yes, you can put systems side by side, but in a sense, you don't care about the spatial configuration of how you do it. You're always free to, you sort of have a, a bag of systems and you're allowed to pick them out. And geometrically, what this amounts to in the diagrammatic syntax is saying that, well, look, if you have a system side by side, you can always, you can always swap the two systems and you can depict the swaps as, uh, as wires twisting over each other. And the sort of the, the difficulty of, uh, or the only difficult content of a symmetric monoidal category is showing that, you know, the the way that the diagrams behave topologically correspond precisely to the algebraic content of of the the morphisms that are the semantics of the of the processes. Which means, which which is to say that as long as you're tracking the connectivity and the connectivity matches between two different diagrams they're going to refer to the same formal entity uh so there is so it's really like a safe syntax to to use right but we can follow this right and this is the this is this is what i said i'm, I'm painting i'm trying to paint the two shoes with one bucket of paint that should be clear i'm trying to arrange to paint the first shoe the orange shoe and then i twist in the second yellow shoe and try to try to apply that process again to do the painting right and then we remember the diagrammatic equations. The diagrammatic equations let us reason directly with this. Um, you know, we, have, we never have to sort of leave the diagrams once we've defined everything. So what do we have? Well, OK, the diagrammatic equation tells us uh, of, of what painting shoes does is, OK, well, this is going to be then the same as, well, I empty the bucket of paint. I paint this blue, right? And you'll note that you know it doesn't matter whether I stretch things. It doesn't matter if I stretch things or I twist the wires around in a symmetric monoidal category. It you know everything up to stretching doesn't matter. All refers to the same configuration of states and uh, applied processes. Uh, but then I run into a problem here because okay, well, so. In a symmetric normal category, everything is okay up to twist. So this thing over here that crosses over, I can sort of pull it. I can yank it all the way to here. Right? And then what do I have? Well, what is this saying? I've just done these diagrammatic derivations to show that, well, I, I apply the equation that tells me that I can use a full can of paint to paint a shoe. And then I run out of paint. And now I'm trying to apply an empty can of paint to a shoe that needs to be painted. And at this point, I'm stuck. I have no more diagrammatic equations to help me to, you know, get this into a simplified state from here. Because, well, we might want to define the painting shoe uh, process to be one such that nothing happens if uh, you put in the empty you put in the empty bucket of paint you don't end up painting the shoe okay <clears throat> for this reason um uh, well, not not constructors yet let us imagine then that we had this magic bucket of paint now this is I've cast a spell on it this is a magic bucket of infinite paint and the nature of this infinite paint is that it's always going to be full. It's always going to have enough paint to paint another shoe. Of course, such a shoe, such a such a bucket of paint cannot exist in our physical reality. You you always have to use up some paint. But if you had this sort of mathematically ideal infinite bucket of paint, then it doesn't matter how many shoes you try to paint. You could always then sort of apply another equation, and then you go like, well, you know, the infinite bucket of paint is not going to run out. So I can I can apply the equation again, and I can paint another shoe, and I can keep painting shoes. And every time I apply the equation, well, it, it never goes from a full state to an empty state. It just stays in the same infinite state, and allows me to perform this task again and again and again, however many times I want. Rather counterintuitively, this is what is meant by possible. So painting a shoe, as I've described it, using just a regular bucket of paint that empties, is actually not a possible task in the framework of constructive theory, right? This is what I mean by verbicide. You know, you'd want to say, of course you can paint a shoe. No, 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 no. Possibility is a completely technical term that refers to the ability of a task to be iterated infinitely. 
And then this thing, this infinite bucket of paint here, this state that enables the task, the environmental state that enables the task to be repeated infinitely, which is to say, after you apply the task once, the resulting transformation on the environment leaves it in such a state that it can do the task again. That thing is a constructor. OK? So, I'm uh, going to uh, move on to what's next. Uh, what, is next? what is next? But this is a good time to ask questions. This is a very good time to ask questions. So I'm gonna... Mohammed, do you want to ask a question? No, I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, well, why? Well, uh, I, I suppose, uh, what else can I say about constructors here? Well, conceptually, where do constructors come from? If you think about, uh, you know, catalysts for some biological reactions, the catalyst is the, the, the notion of a catalyst in, in chemistry and, and biochemistry. This is, this is one of the sort of, um, uh, yeah the sort of intellectual sources of this idea of a constructor. You know, if you replace constructor with catalyst, it doesn't really change much about how you should intuit the thing. It's this idea that, well, you know, you need it in order to help this help this uh, transformation occur, but then at the end, you just get the catalyst back and then the catalyst is unchanged and you can go and, and participate in another, uh, participate in another reaction. All right, so, so that's, this is the sort of idea of like what a constructor is. Um, okay. So why again is uh, what should I talk about here? We can talk about okay. We, we still have to get to this idea of the cut. So how is it? How is it that this? How is it that these uh, cons uh, having this notion now of a constructor helps us define what we mean by a cut? Yeah, that's it. Cut of possible and not possible. Okay. So what is a constructor? Okay. Let's, I'm going to rehearse one more time this, uh, but I'm going to simplify it. Uh, what I want to do here. Yeah, okay. And I have now this, this infinite bucket of paint, right? And I have all well, the shoes I'll get to in a second. Okay, so for, whatever reason, constructive theorists really like to use the category of sets and relations. They really like to think of things in terms of sets and, and relations, um, which is a problem when you're trying to model quantum things, and we can get into that in a second. Um, how did this come about? Well, you know, the usual way, which is to say when David Deutsch wrote his first paper, he said, well, you know, let's just, you know, let's take sets and relations as this sort of setting where we can start doing some calculations and we'll use it as a placeholder setting for now and of course you know no one no one bothers to ever go back and change the placeholder then it then the, the placeholder becomes a standard so okay fine they use they use sets and relations and then so the the systems in the process theory we'd call them systems but in the uh constructor theory we would call them substrates or the environments they're all just going to be sets they're going to be sets of they're going to be sets of and again, we're, we're, we're dying under the terminology here. Sets of macro states. Why do we want? What's what's this talk about macro states? Well, okay. I mean, like this is a this is a deep constructor theory lore thing because they need to just they need to talk about like thermodynamics in a second. Um, so why macro states? Because there's lots of different ways a shoe can be blue. There's, you know, if you're really looking at it at the at the molecular level. You know, there's all these different configurations and, you know, you kind of don't care and you want to say like, well, look, all of them just count as blue as far as I'm concerned. We'll call all of that, we'll call all of that the, the macro state of the, the shoe being blue. And then there's shoe being whatever other color and you don't really care. Uh, and then the job of this task, job of this task here is just to take the macro states that are not blue and to turn them into macro states that are blue. 
And it must be so for, well, it doesn't matter if this is a set, that's going to be a set of microstates, macrostates. Turns out, doesn't matter. When you're working process theoretically, we show in the paper that, like, look, there is this, uh, there is this distinction at the mathematical level when constructive theorists talk about this between like a particular molecular configuration and the macro state of a collection, a sub collection of configurations that are blue or whatever. But you know, what we show is that look, look, in this system, it doesn't matter. You can just work directly with the macro states because that would you, that's what you really want. And it turns out mathematically it doesn't make a difference. So what are we saying a constructor is? So here's the definition of a constructor. We're saying that this equation ought to hold. All right. What do I mean by this? I mean by this. So in the language of uh, in the diagrammatic language for sets and relations, you've got a special state and you've got a special something that's it's a co-state or an effect, something that only takes inputs and doesn't give you any outputs. What's this special state? Remember, states in the symmetric modal category of relations, uh, sets and relations, are subsets. And this special state is the special subset of everything in the. So, what this part, the diagram says here, just up to here, saying, okay, well, look, here's my constructor. That's in my environment. And my substrate is, well, okay, I don't care what you put in here. It could be any macro state. But you perform this task, <clears throat> and then the opposite of give me everything. Well, here is the effect, the relation that is the converse of this is uh, well something that takes every uh, it's something that takes every element of the set to the single singleton. So it's it's the equivalent of deleting or forgetting about it. And in total, what this is saying here: look, if you apply this, if you apply this process, view it as a task. It takes this constructor in the environment acting on a substrate. Now, look, if you if you forget about it, marginalize over, or you just trace out, or whatever words you want to use to say just forget about it, it doesn't matter what you put in, in the substrate. You're going to get back something that is good to go again as a constructor. And now, rather than equality, because we're working in sets and relations, and recall that these states are now subsets, we can say, well, look, if I, if I, give, you, if I give you a constructor, what I, what I mean to give you here is a subs I'm going to give you a, a set or a collection of macro states that all work as constructors. Um, because, of course, the infinite bucket of paint might also have microstates. You know, the paint could be in different configurations, but they might all be equally infinite and good for the pro good for this task. But I give you all of these, and if you apply the if you apply the process to it and you do the task, you get back you get back uh, a set of states that is good to go again as uh, to, to to run this. You can just plug that into another copy of this equation, and you can just get it again and again. This is now minus the. Now we can just take away all of the sort of stuff that's still tethering us to intuition. And at that point, that is just the definition of a constructor. <clears throat> right. This is that. That's a constructor. Yeah. OK. So what can we do? Uh, what can we do with uh, Constructors. So recall now this is this is going to be the constructor, and this is by virtue a task which by virtue of having a constructor, that's going to be a possible task. Right. Possible task. And now final bit that we need to get to to end the, this conceptual story of what's going on in the paper, and we can move on to a discussion, is, uh, well, what, did, what do we mean by this cut? Remember, there was this cut between, you know, so there's all these conceivable tasks, and then there was a cut, that, then you had all these possible tasks, and then all these impossible tasks. How do you get that cut again? Well, you know, you have a sub-process theory. 
So process theory, process theory is closed under composition in two ways. You can compose processes in sequence and you can compose processes in parallel. A process theory says, well, you give me a bunch of processes and a process theory says, well, I'll, I'll give you the closure. All the conceivability is the closure of these processes under sequential and parallel composition. And just, you know, uh, what I mean by sub-process theory, well, in the same way that you can have a subgroup or you can have a, 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 a you can have a vector space that embeds into another, you know, a sub something of some other mathematical construct. We're saying, well, you can also have another process theory where you start off with a subset of processes and then you take the closure of that under sequential and parallel composition and twists in the case of the symmetric modal category. And then you end up with, well, that's also a process theory. And it can be a process theory that's a subset of a larger process theory. And so translating all of that into so, so translating the sort of mathematics there into sort of touching the constructor theory, we'd be saying that look, what we would have to show in order to claim that you know this definition is somehow good for where constructor theory uh, constructor theorists want to go, is we want to say that the possible tasks themselves form a process theory. The possible tasks, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, that means just that, you know, if I, if I give you or identify where the possible tasks are, which tasks are possible in an ambient process theory, then these possible tasks with constructors form a sub-symmetric monoidal category, which is to say the sequential or parallel composition of possible tasks again yields a possible task. Right. And that is not too difficult to show. That is not too difficult to show. And perhaps like you can, you know, this is the sort of thing that you can, this is the sort of thing that you can try at home if you have, uh, if you have the pen and paper to follow along. All I have to do, well, once you have this equation, I mean, all you have to do is check you know, because this is this, not, sorry, this in equation, this subset hood relation must be verified to define uh, whether a task is possible. This, this inequality simultaneously defines possible tasks and constructors. So uh, that has to be verified for every sequential composite that you can come up with and every parallel composite that you can come up with. And that's not so bad. I'll, I'll show you, show you, show you one maybe. Um, again, questions, welcome. Is the mind a constructor? Is the mind a constructor? Yeah, well, that depends on your, depends on what you mean. <laughs> it depends on, depends on the, the, the process theory or this, or whatever other mathematical incarnation you pick for the constructive theory. Remember, it's a meta theory, you bring your own mathematics. So I can't answer that question until the mathematics is brought and there, you know, all the English has been turned into math. And then I can say, oh yes, that's a short or no. So it depends. That's pretty good. I like that. Okay. What is the, okay. Here, let's say I have, I have two tasks. I'm, well, I'm not a fan of using letters. I'm more of a fan of using colors, but if anyone is, uh, if anyone is colorblind or if anything's not clear, then just let me know. Uh -huh. right. Maybe there's a different. Yep. Right. Then just to make sure everything matches up in this end. So here is how here is how we're going to sequentially compose tasks, right? Uh, this here is a task. Uh, task one, task two, both tasks they work on the same substrate. So, for example, paint a shoe and then unpaint a shoe. Sequential composition of tasks. Well, if you're going to sequentially compose, it needs to be on the same substrate. Otherwise, sequential composition that's meaningless. And you might want something like parallel composition instead. So, for example, you can 
compose the tasks, which may not be possible tasks. So paint the shoe and then strip the shoe of paint. I don't like it, you know, do something else with it. Um, and here's how we will sequentially compose just conceivable tasks. If you have a conceivable task that's operating on this orange substrate, you need to compose something else that takes orange as that substrate again. But what about the environment? The environment can differ. Like for example, if I'm going to paint a shoe with paint versus if I'm going to, I don't know, do one of those elect uh, electrolysis chrome dipping of a shoe to get it covered in chrome, the environment is going to be different, right? So for the first task, I have this particular for the first task, I have this particular environment. The second task, that has its own particular environment. Those environments are just systems. And I say that, well, OK, if I'm going to sequentially compose, I feed in the requisite environment to do task number one. And then I twist in and feed in the requisite environment to do task number two. And then just to make sure that everything type checks at the end. This entire thing here, right? This entire thing here. Now, maybe it's better if I, I gather these guys here to make it clear. All right, that's sequential composition. What is it saying? All right, you can always gather. Systems can also be composite systems that are placed next to each other. This entire thing says, well, you've got to give me the environments for the two different tasks and the substrate. And I'll give you back the environments again for the two different tasks and the substrate. That's how we achieve the sequential composition of tasks. So these two small tasks, put them together just like this, and then you get this one big task, right? <clears throat> what about parallel composition? Parallel composition looks fairly similar. With parallel composition, you can compose whatever. It doesn't really. Uh, parallel composition doesn't particularly matter. If I get this right here. So we got substrate one, you know, an orange. We got substrate two over here. I'm going to do it like this. That makes things easier. We got environment one, and then environment two. And then those are your two tasks. And this is your composite task. Is that all visible from there? I wonder. Hopefully, that's kind of visible here from this. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, again, what are we saying? Well, we've got, if you want to parallel compose, Parallel composition of tasks is fantastic. You don't need to match up with the substrate. You can simultaneously on one side paint shoes and the other one go, you know, do your taxes or whatever it is, is another task, whatever. Uh, so you can have two completely different substrates, doesn't particularly matter. You have two different environments for those substrates in that particular task. And here's the parallel composition of conceivable tasks. You know, same principle. If you understand sequential composition and uh, you're happy with just intuiting the twisting wires, then you're good. And now to verify that these guys are, um, so now that to verify that the composition of possible tasks is again, a possible task. So now, now let's say that these guys are possible tasks. In other words, that there is a particular constructor for uh, green, and there's a particular constructor or yellow over here. All right. And remember to check the condition. And just delete those. All right. So how do we go about verifying this? Well, Um, what we want to do is we want to apply the screen one here. First, we probably want some kind of formal condition on our tasks, on our possible tasks, to tell us that this goes through. 
to then get us that we have this series of inequalities. I'm winging it here, but there's going to be a proper worked out version in the, you know, in the longer version of this paper. Green. That goes through. That goes in. I'm, I'm happy to take questions while I'm, while I'm just over here messing around. And then apply it again. Right. I think in the paper we do like one of these variations as well. The principle is kind of simple. You apply the equation that, uh, sorry, the in the the containment relationship that defines possibility on uh, on both of these one by one, and you also make use of the fact that well, there's the special state and that one that corresponds to everything and delete. You can pull those through as well uh, for tasks. Then you end up with this, and then you go, okay, fine. I verified that this is uh, I verified that this is a Possible task, and then you do the same for parallel composition, and then you're done. Then you say, okay, well, if I I know that if I have sequential and parallel composition, plus checking the twists, okay, that then I have another process theory, which means that my possible tasks form a a, a process theory. So what do I have? I get to say, I get to finally give, you know, mathematically formal voice to what a constructive theorist might want to do. So again, I have this first domain here. What is that? That is going to be this space of conceivable tasks. That's going to be some symmetric monoidal category, which is telling me this is the domain in which I'm interpreting a particular process theory. And these in this symmetric nodal category, well, my conceivable tasks, they can compose in sequence and in parallel. And what do I mean by the cut? Well, the cut that distinguishes what is possible from impossible. Well, it turns out that the possible stuff, that is also a symmetric monoidal category. And that's a symmetric monoidal category that embeds into the larger one. It embeds in the same way that a subgroup embeds. It embeds in the same way that um, a, sub, a vector subspace or a linear subspace is going to embed into a larger one. And then everything else, well, then everything else is going to be, well, you know, no promises. This is not the sort of stuff, this is the, you know, impossible stuff is the stuff that doesn't necessarily iterate infinitely because they don't have constructors. And, and if you followed along so far, um, and there's more details in the paper, for, if you want to like look up the formal details, uh, you understand now constructor theory minus principle of locality, um, which is perhaps not interesting enough to merit uh, further comment. But um, if someone's curious about it, we can talk about it. Uh, but you know, so what I presented so far um, is, you know, I, a constructor theorist would also be happy to say, yes, this is constructor theory minus principle of locality. So you don't go around telling, you know, saying that this thing is just constructive theory to a constructive theorist because they'll get mad at you, and they'll say no, 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 it's missing the principle of locality. But that's a dogma, and you don't you don't particularly need it. Like that's it, it messes a lot of things up. Okay, so that's that's all I have to say for now. I think, and uh, yeah, happy to take it to a discussion now. Awesome. Wow. Um, Mohammed, would you like oh. to give a first comment or reflection or just share what, what angle you participated in the work from? Yeah, I am interested in applying this formalism to uh, the various examples that constructive theory has been applied to. So you might have seen papers by Chiara Maletto and David on constructed theory of information and constructed theory of life. And I'm also interested in seeing how it applies to quantum theory. 
and if mm -hmm. the process view can be shown to be uh, superior to the constructed theoretic view. Cool. So if you have a given system of interest, like let's just say a cognitive system, like a person or mm -hmm. an ant or something like that, like how do you mm -hmm. go about demarcating what tasks are in play? Are these cognitive tasks or mm -hmm. are these the tasks that the body performs? How do we begin to, mm -hmm. to analyze a situation in a way that's amenable to, to being framed like this? Um, so, but, but like this, could you, ref could you refine the, uh, the discourse referent? What do you mean by this? Yeah. If, if we want to <laughs> understand, yeah, the... if, if we want to understand a given informal actual embodied system mm -hmm. in a way that's amenable to all of the compositional bountiful benefits what are we actually sure. looking to break down about that system of interest sure um uh, so when we talked about so, so tasks are kind of an kind of this ad hoc thing right just remember that when we drew tasks so we drew them like directed in this way because we had to say something about their direction and then we distinguished between their substrates and their environments and then we said that uh systems are always these things which sort of have their you know sorry the task is something that takes in the system and the environment and returns to the same system and environment which is which is something that you you can just accept but also you know in general a process doesn't need to have the same inputs and output types so this is you know this is perfectly fine as well you can have a process that's shaped like that and maybe for some sorts of you know at the whatever level of abstraction you care about um it might be more well maybe there's maybe this level of abstraction where you don't care about the actual physics of what's going on where everything is sort of like uh, conservative on some level you might just care about a view of the system where you have inputs and output types, in which case um, the language of, or the, the framework of thinking about tasks is uh, perhaps less fundamental. I mean, one of the points that we were making here is like the framework of thinking in tasks is a task is a constructed concept on top of the more fundamental and primitive notion of just being able to construct processes or, and, and, or just being able to uh, compose processes. So then it would depend now on, on what you sort of want from um, your notion of task. So what we, what we were able to show is that look, just using the language of process theory, we were able to code and formalize this particular notion of what we want tasks to behave like. Um, but then depending on what you would consider a task to be, maybe the same, maybe different, um, you can encode it in this, in this mathematical language. Uh, and then start reasoning about it in a diagrammatic way. And there's a lot of things you can reason about in process theoretic. There's a there's a there's a laundry list of them in the paper, like electrical circuit theory, quantum theory, most notably, um, linear algebra, first order logic. Yeah, it's all good. Um, maybe that's maybe that's not quite a satisfactory direct answer, but perhaps we can refine the the question and the and the target. So to add to add to it, uh, it's up to it's up to the modeler or the user to decide which processes are to be modeled. So you can, I mean, if you want to, if you want to think about cognitive processes, then you are, you know, you can create a subsymmetric model category to work with that. But you can also have uh, more mechanical process theories, or it can even have one where both mechanical and cognitive processes interact. So it's up to the model, I would say. There's no hard and fast rule in the formalism. It's the shoe painting factory. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a lot, lot to say on that. Um, in active mm -hmm. inference, we're often interested in a general cybernetic 
entity or thing. Something that's engaging in sense making on the inbound and on mm -hmm. action selection decision making on the outbound. And another important idea from ecological psychology is this notion of like extended mm -hmm. cognition and the environment and the interactions of the agent and the environment. So I wondered, is the substrate, uh, uh, you were twisting different environments in and keeping the spotlight on the thing. It, is mm. that mm. how you track an entity as things change around it? Is by twisting in and, um, and out different contexts or uh, right um, so that um, that is just the way for that is just a way to define a to define to, to define uh, the sequential composition or the parallel composition of tasks in a way that relies upon a more primitive notion of the sequential and parallel composition of processes. So the, the twisting in and the keeping a spotlight on a particular context. So, so one of the things that, so one of the things that we've seen um, that, that, you, that we've all seen in this, uh, in these examples is that uh, you can start with a process theory of like basic uh, processes that just compose in sequence and in parallel. And then you can define a new way to compose in sequence and in parallel on top of that. And that would give you a new symmetric monodal category that would give you a new process theory. So, so you can kind of, yeah, yeah, this is, so this is process theory kind of, there's, there's a dog food thing here somewhere where you're kind of eating your own dog food, right? Um, in the case of the, the twisting, which was, oh, what was the twisting again? Case of the twisting, we were saying that okay, well, look, we're going to define instead of just plugging things together, we're going to define a new kind of uh, we're going to find a new kind of uh, sequential composition that looks like this, where instead of just taking two boxes and joining them together, we do all this other we do all this other business over here, like this is this is this other business over here, right? Right. Um, that's allowed and good and expressive but that's also something that the mathematics has no stance on like if you so you you brought in these concepts like this is how you're spotlighting a particular substrate and keep and switching out the context right and if you look at the diagram it's perfectly okay to start pointing at these things saying well of course you're spotlighting the substrate and you're switching out the context but that's on you that's on you. The mathematics just just tells you like this is a way to compose in sequence, um, but it does so nicely enough in a way that's you know where where this sort of uh, the sort of we can we can bring our linguistic intuitions to bear on the situation in a, in a much more direct way because we have the the visuality of it available to us. Yeah, that's very deep. The necessary and sufficient conveyance is on the blackboard mm -hmm. and then that yes. enables us to take perspectives and direct attention and have um, procedural flows with our attention and tell narratives and and again have interpretations but the mm -hmm. interpretation isn't what's written on the screen yes 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 all right a question from the live chat can you please explain in what way does that cut, I believe between the possible mm -hmm. and impossible, allow yeah, the yeah. modeler to express emergent phenomena or laws that arise from the underlying processes in constructor theory? Emergent processes or laws that arise from the underlying... In what in what ways does the cut allow the modeler to express emergent phenomena or laws that arise from the underlying processes? Yeah, well, um, if I could just ask for clarification from live chat here, 
uh, and maybe Hamza can weigh in as well. But like, what's your well, what's a what's your favorite toy example of the uh, emergence? I'm not a constructive theorist, but you know, we can play with the system and we can play with the system live and, and see what we what we get at. But first, we're gonna, you know, what, what are you thinking in terms of emergence? People mean different things sometimes when they when they say that, right? How about the the arising directionality of a flock of birds? The arising directionality of a flock of birds. Mm -hmm. Oh, as in there's a dynamic system that's evolving over time, which is you've got these birds that are interacting with each other locally, and then they and then they end up. Uh... Yes. I wonder. Would these, so I think the safe answer, or my, my intuition would say that the vast majority of things you would consider to be possible are not actually technically possible in constructor theory, right? So right off the bat, you can say, look, you've got this intuition. So, so if you thought painting shoes was a fine, sensible thing, and you think that birds flying around and interacting with each other is a fine, sensible thing, that's possible, that probably isn't what is meant by possible. So, it, so in the case of like a in the case of like a bird system, you've got this massive interacting system, fine. A constructor, a con you know, you probably could have like a sort of infinite shotgun constructor that just stops all the birds dead in their tracks again and again, and you can you can kill as many birds as you want. What would a constructor for this sort of system be? Well, if you can set up a, if you can set up an environment that sort of steers the birds, a possible task. Maybe for a chaotic system, the only possible task is the trivial one, where you don't expect anything to be done and you accept any sort of outcome. Uh, but if you want a particular possible task, that's tantamount to programming like a flock of birds or finding some way to program a thought flock of birds like in a deterministic and set way that you can keep doing it again and again, right? Yeah. So. So what is the relationship between constructor theory and programming? Um, there's, that's a pretty good question. Um, I'm gonna try my best to answer on behalf of constructor theorists here. Um, but there, there's this, uh, there's a sort of there's an information theory or a pers or, or a perspective on information theory that also comes about from constructive theory. So as a as a math and computer scientist myself, I'd say that perhaps the most fundamental uh, point of contact between constructive theory and programming is in a notion of information and what in particular you're allowed to do with it. So in a quantum setting, you cannot clone information. I mean, your information is carried in your qubits, and you have no cloning, so you can't you can't clone information. Um, whereas, and everything is not everything that's not classical. You know, the technical terms say well, everything is not quantum. You call it classical. In a classical setting, you can copy information. You can write down a one or a zero on a piece of paper, and you can get someone to copy down the one and zero as many times as you want. And you can stick the ones and zeros into filing cabinets, and you, so and by so doing, perform computation with copying. So the difference there is well, okay. Um, if you've got different sort of underlying capacities for copying things and, and not being able to copy things in your underlying process theory, um, what is, uh, I guess, the sorts of, there's questions to ask about the sorts of programs you can write, but that's kind of, kind of at a, at a, at a much more fundamental level. I mean, constructor theory, if you if you gave me a if you gave a particular process theory of programs, then we can start talking constructive theory. Um, constructive theorists, so I think by and large, are more interested in the physics, which is at a much lower and more basic level of abstraction. So I I don't know when you're so when you're asking about like is this you know is this a get rich quick scheme when it comes to emergence? Is this a get rich quick scheme when it comes to you know programming and understanding chaotic behavior, et cetera, et cetera? You know. Sorry, but the answer is no. <laughs> like there's there's nothing the extent I mean, if you can under you understood the content of constructive theory in about like an hour and it was all pictures, like there's nothing more complicated than that. Everything else beyond that is you hallucinating interpretations onto the pictures. It's a get 
epistemically rich <laughs> quick scheme. You just get yeah. seven dollars. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Get epistemically rich quick. You know, you've got the pictures and they're very suggestive. But the, you know, in in principle, it's no different from like a, a tarot reading. You, you've got just a very suggestive of mathematics, and and you can read whatever meanings that in you want. And if you play with the mathematics, you can also get some meanings out. But you know, you only get it out as much as you put in in terms of like a epistemically weight bearing interpretations of hallucinations in the first place, right? Well, it's an interesting date <laughs> with constructor theory and process theory and active inference, none of which are opinionated in the last mile about any given system but all of which are providing us higher levels of expressivity and mm -hmm. increasingly in active inference category theory is being mm -hmm. used to represent the kinds of generative models that are used and so there's the math and the analytical mm -hmm. equations yeah. And then there's yep. the kinds of Bayesian graphs that we've traditionally looked at, the partially observable Markov yep. decision processes. Yep. And then in the last mm -hmm. years, there's some mm -hmm. string diagrams and all these other features coming in that are helping like expand mm -hmm. the scope of what kinds of cognitive models and the relationships between substrates and cognitive processes that we want to explore. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I, I, I'm familiar with the... Uh... Um, I'm friends with Toby, Toby Sinclair uh, Smythe, and uh, yeah, so that's that's my only contact to active inference. But I can I can definitely see the um, the appeal of having a um, the, the appeal of having non opinionated mathematics for for things that in the last mile, as you say, don't have an opinion. And but but you know I'm I'm say, I'm butchering it I'm tired and I'm saying it all wrong but I'm I'm saying that look I think it's a good idea to have like a math of composition to deal with a complex system that's fundamentally compositional. Yeah. Um, so what do we yeah. what modules do we load in or what do we bring in in our environment to be able to mm. to load up and actually use? So we said bring your own math that was right at the beginning. So it's like, okay, what do I bring? P Piano's axioms? Or what do I bring? Like my F of X? Or w what sure. do you mean by the mathematics that has to be brought? Okay. Um, so when it comes, so, so the, the, the sort of a basic, uh, the, 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 the core module that, that you sort of get with process theories is a theory of composition that works for uh, anything that you can name processes that act on systems, and these processes can compose in sequence and in parallel. This is the this is the sort of basic conceptual map that you get and becomes gun to head formal when you load it into a process theory. That's that's what you get. That's core. And then everything else. Uh, is actually expressed like sort of in terms of the in terms of the diagram. So, for example, this piano's axioms, right? Um, let's talk about the what is it? Nice. I forget what the axioms are, but I know that there are two generators. You've got a zero. You got a zero state, and then you've got a successor box, right? And maybe the first thing that you want to do, if you want to actually, well, you want to load in um, anything that you can express at the end of the day in terms of algebra and symbols and equations is also doable um, with also doable like diagrammatically. Like for example, I believe that in the piano formulation, the addition operation is something that sort of uh, that behaves like a homomorphism with respect to or like a module with respect to the successor box, so something like, um, I think something like this is right. Yeah, so it's if almost you have like an the, equation the, like that. That it, the axioms are proto procedural in that they mm -hmm. define exactly what can and can't be done. Indeed, indeed. So the the sort of benefit of thinking in a or let's say depicting in a process theoretic way is that 
well, look, if you're more used to talking about processes and how they interact and you, you don't really care, you don't want to, you know, spell out from the bottom up how they're implemented and do a sort of calculation with like the specifics, what you really just care about are the operational constraints of how they compose and behave when you compose them together. And you can express them in terms of equations or containment relations or whatever else, then the process theory is much better. As opposed to, for example, just dealing with the sets, you know, the, you know, especially if you've got like a very complex system, then you know, no hope. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Again, to these two key features of cognitive mm -hmm. systems, like the sense making on the inbound mm -hmm. and the uh, the associated world model, and then the action selection. I I thought about the first blob you drew with the conceivable. That's like. Mm -hmm. Well, you drew the lines and we have the rest of the blackboard. So it's like, we know that there's unconceivable, but that's, that's the scope of the sense making for a given mm -hmm. setting. And then the, the line between what is possible and what isn't possible is, is what is actionable. And I guess you can mm -hmm. develop mm -hmm. thought settings where, okay, well, I'm going to um, speculate what could happen if I could lift up. 10,000 pounds, and then you could do mm -hmm. tasks related to moving cargo containers. Whereas if you mm -hmm. um, were using tweezers and you defined mm -hmm. what was possible with, with a different threshold, then there'd be different kinds of pl plausible tasks. And yeah, so yeah, so for, for a sort of what, what might interest you is, well, I'm going to shill it now, why not? I've got some time. My interest to you for this sort of reading is that, well, for constructive theory, you know, it really just wants to force you on one side of a binary. And this may be too restrictive, you know, in terms of expressive capacity when you're trying to especially map it onto something that involves anything as complex as a distinction between cognitive and physical tasks and processes, right? And and we had questions to this uh, to this effect earlier as well. Like, what do we do with the likely? What do we do with the vanishingly unlikely? What do we do with the plausible? Right? How do we? So, I want to point out that, and this is something that's coming in the longer version of the paper is a is a relationship between um, uh, constructor uh, constructor theory as a special case of resource theories. So, you know. This idea that you have to, with the constructor theory, you have to either go like infinitely many times or, you know, infinite or bust. A resource theory is sort of going like, yeah, but, you know, we'd be happy also if we can do it a couple of times. <laughs> we'd be happy if we can, you know, tell me how many times you can do it. You know, that's pretty good. And so, you know, resource theory in principle give you this idea of like, well, you know, here's the sort of things that you can do once, you can do twice, that you can do three times, you can do da 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 da. da. And finally, you know, in the in the very, very core over here, you know, that's the sort of stuff that's picked out. That's the sort of stuff that can be picked out by a constructive theoretic cut in the limit. Whereas a resource theoretic point of view is saying like, well, of course, you know, you, if you want to make more distinction than that, then like an easy generalization that's also quite simple to think about is, let's talk about the stuff that we can do for free all the time. Let's talk about the things that we only, you know, we only get to do once. Um, and it turns out that resource theories are particularly, you know, resource theories are actually like a practical bit of mathematics when it comes to uh, quantum circuit optimization, because there are certain components that are very expensive and you want to be able to work out what sort of quantum maps you can implement only using this particular, say, T gate, let's say like three times, <laughs> or maybe you get like one extra one, or maybe you get like two less, and then, you know, the resource theory is going to tell you precisely you know, what your gain and loss and expressive capacity is when you have more fewer, fewer or, or more resources, which is something that is a very computer science-y down-to-earth practical thing as opposed to just the distinction between infinity and and everything else that the constructive theory gives you. But sneak peek for, for some that's coming, the, the next the next installment or the extended version of this paper that's going on archive. That is super... Yeah exciting and relevant certainly yeah. organizations or any other kind of system that's being designed and having an ability to handle the finite um mm -hmm. very relevant here's one other kind mm -hmm. of speculative question so of course yeah. we had the, the ice cream melting and unmelting 
Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had the ice cream um, unmelting as impossible. Yeah. But of course, yeah, yeah. I, in yeah, a freezer, yeah, yeah, yeah. in a freezer, it, it does happen and or at room temperature with a reversed time yeah. arrow. And so yeah, within yeah, this yeah, notion yeah. of the um, Gibbs free energy, we have catalysts mm -hmm. like protein enzymes, which are not able to enable what isn't possible, but rather they can accelerate by mm -hmm reducing the activation energy and they can accelerate a negative delta G and they can accelerate something mm -hmm. that is possible catalytically, hence catalyst mm -hmm. and be regenerated. Right. And it right. made me think about the change in variational free energy as the ball rolling downhill mm -hmm. cognitively and about how mm -hmm. the, the channels and the landscapes of the mind or of the cognitive system um, mm -hmm. sometimes the landscape is changed and what is possible becomes different. But just because something's possible mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's ever reached. And then we still need this question of the catalyst to actually implement yeah. and get it to where it can be. Right. Right. And, and I, I think that perhaps one of the, one of the sort of intuitive appeals of constructive theory is that, you know, at first glance and with an intuitive mapping of concepts, this sound it's constructor theory sounds like the right kind of mathematics to talk about you know these con these interactive concepts that you're talking about the, the free energy and catalysis as enabling but the caveat with constructor theory remember is infinite or bust hard binaries which means that if you want to do so like i'm sorry to say but if you want to do anything that's remotely nuanced more nuanced than like a pair of qubits interacting, which already, because of principal locality, gives constructor theorists a lot of pain. <laughs> constructor theory is probably not the right system for you. <laughs> Process theories, though, if you want to deal with composition, not bad. And especially, you, you know, you get a you get diagrams for free, and also you get other add-ons that are very good at doing the sort of things that you want to do. Let's have the right uh, expressivity and shape, like resource theories. Constructor theory, one should think of as a particular way or me methodology uh, that's designed for a particular problem to be a meta theory of physics in in whatever David in whatever David Deutsch considers to be like a sort of conceptually clean setting of just being able to make a single cut to tell you about like to to distinguish in a black and white way. All of all of physics interesting so. and in the bayesian mechanics which is mm -hmm. some of the recent developments in the uh, active inference and free energy principle area mm -hmm. that yeah grounding of physics to i guess mm -hmm. what we want to call physical even though we know that so many asterisks have to be added when we knock on the wood and everything like that but mm -hmm. if the physics of cognitive systems can be described purely informationally then we can have a procedural mm. compositional cognitive physics that would enable us to do anything from the mind conceptualizing that the shoe could be a different color to the multi-agent setting mm. and composed across individuals and there's just there's there's more walls to paint on than <laughs> There are many possible mm -hmm. walls to paint on. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. What What are you curious about? Or I mean, what What's an exciting direction? Um, in terms of uh, In terms of what exactly? Because in in terms of uh, this whole business with constructive theory, this is kind of a side project for me. Uh, <laughs> a, a fun one, but uh, just a, just a side interest. Um, what's your the, What's your main yes, interest, or what What motivates, or what excites the context such that this could be a side interest? Um. Well, uh, you know, my my main interest is is more. Uh, I suppose it's more aligned with. with this notion of sense making 
um, my my interest is sort of uh, using diagrams not only for sense making but as a formal uh, platform to you know articulate theories of what sense making might be. So I played around with so these diagrams that you know they're good for quantum, for example, but the same kind of mathematics is quite good for other sorts of composite. You know, th there are other domains, not just for example psychology, that are you know dearly in need of some sort of uh, compositionally native approach like diagrams, like linguistics, for example. Um, so um, I like to draw language and uh, because language is a particular tool of sense making and then to formalize the, the kind of sense making that we make, for example, when we, you know, we use, we use metaphor to like, to get the point across relies on a complex metaphor where information is stuck into uh, words as a box and then the box is moved across a conduit and this sort of sense making um is beyond the merely let's say truth theoretic uh yet nevertheless is systematic in a way such that the compositional aspects of the language precisely map onto the compositional aspects of the domain of sense making um and i suspect that's where uh we might have more to talk about um because you know sense making is I consider sense making it's, it's a it's you know capital s very it's a it's a very big thing and perhaps like the important activity to understand um and i'm interested in the systematicity of it and in particular trying to depict that systematicity there's something yeah there's something that's you know direct about the about string diagrams in the same way that perfume or music is sort of directed it's not mediated by the you know by the by the rows of greek and the symbols right so i don't know maybe maybe that's uh yeah wow there's a lot there can we say that the the screen is the substrate that we're writing language on if we're going by hand with pen and then we have an infinite pen and this is mm -hmm. this is the inexhaustible pen and then mm -hmm. that certainly does seem to be one thing at which the yeah 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 i mean you mean to refer to the, in the context of the mind we have a i mean as long as we're not aphantasic we have a sort of theater of mind that sort of infinitely refreshable paper or infinitely refreshable uh stage for us to arrange things on and 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 sort of re replenish the representation. That that does sound kind of like a constructor. If we're if we're happy also to sort of uh, uh, sort of rule out Her Heraclitus or Heraclitus, you you mentioned Her uh, Heraclitus earlier. You know, a man never steps in the same river twice. You know, are we insofar as we are the same entity that is perhaps um, observing the theater of mind as we're infinitely refreshing it, then fine. Yeah, it's a constructor, but is it the same if, if you know, 10 years on, you're, you're a functionally different person? Is that still, uh, is it, is it still the same task? <laughs> if it's, it, if it's, is it still the same task refreshing or looking at a memory 10 years on? I don't know. Yeah. The eye is, able to to nest subtasks however it may mm. not have the awareness to know what it is embedded within but at least within mm. this internal theater mm -hmm. it can make a sub representation mm. that it believes could be wrong but that it believes mm -hmm. would have continuity also beyond itself, mm -hmm. but also not saying what is beyond itself. Beyond itself in, in, in what sense? Um, like there's the uh, environments that um, mm -hmm. one is confronted with, and then one could at least suspect that there are other environments that one is not being confronted with, but also know that mm -hmm. they can't say anything more than that about environments that they aren't being confronted with. 
Hmm. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure what to say to that, but I'll have to think about that. That's, Mohammed, any it, last? It's difficult. Yeah. Comments before yeah. you have to go. Um. No, I'm I'm pretty oh. good. Um. Uh, just I'd like to everyone to know that the a longer version of this very paper is uh going to come out soon ish on archive where uh we work out some more examples we relate constructor theory to resource theories and everything is going to be very readable so if this condensed uh, journal version is a bit technical and difficult to follow watch the space and there's going to be a, a longer and more pedestrian version that hopefully everyone can follow yeah great thank you both for joining hope yeah. to um See you again. It's a very exciting and evocative line of work. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. I'll see you again soon. Farewell.